and human gametes are such that you know it can they can rectify their problems automatically at an age even if there is a sperm problem if the egg is very he- healthy and young then it gets rectified it rectifies the problem of the sperm even if the male has a problem it gets rectified when you eat foods from a plastic container which is which is hot the food if it is hot it produces some chemicals which act on the uh, ovaries and it reduces the uh, ovarian reserve slowly so in the same way the sperm can also get affected so the uh, the government is trying to regulate uh, how the clinic works who gives the treatment to the patient what is the experience that is needed like in according to the uh, this law at least 3 years of uh, training should be there at the super specialty level before they are able to independently treat the patient Hello and welcome to another episode of Fertility Tales powered by Nova IVF. I'm your host Simrat and today we are delving deep into the evolving legal landscape of fertility treatment in India with a very special guest, Dr. Lakshmi Chirumamila. Dr. Lakshmi is the National Strategy Director and Senior Clinical Director of Nova IVF and practices in Banjara Hills and LB Nagar, Hyderabad. A distinguished fertility specialist with over 20 years of experience in the fertility field, she's played a pivotal role in the journey of thousands of couples towards parenthood both in India and abroad. specializing in various complex fertility issues dr lakshmi it's a pleasure to have you with us thank you let's start at the very beginning uh, what drew you to medicine in the first place and how did you choose fertility as a specialization my father is a doctor maybe that was the initial inspiration of course but later you know previously when we were kids the medical field is not so advanced lot of deaths because of lack of facilities right. lack of appropriate doctors so maybe that has inspired me to become a doctor initially all right yeah so that's how i think and then i had my grandmom passed away because of heart attack mm-hmm. so that was also one of the inspirations all right so that yeah, left so an impact on me impact on me so thought okay better i help people in regards to health and uh, so that's how i got the inspiration to develop to become a doctor how how inspiring and what about fertility specialization how did you get about into that so initially i thought i would become a cardiologist <laughs> but it was a 360 degrees change after i started my internship in gynec okay so lot of deliveries used to happen lot of mothers with lot of uh, problems so every day it's a new challenge in gynec so i thought okay this is a field you know i can practice both medicine and uh, surgery both in one one specialty that is okay. gynec okay and then obstetrics is a challenge day, every day every patient is a new new scenario so that's how i started interest in gynec and took a um, gynec field mm-hmm. uh, i did my post graduation in gynecology later when i moved to uk then slowly these advances in infertility the rapid growing field mm-hmm. so attracted me a lot so initially i did a research fellowship in infertility okay and uh, finally i thought okay this is the way forward for me on all it's inspired you into fertility and fet- fertility specialization so it's a new developing field with a lot of challenges where the success is very low lot of uh, humiliation especially in our society true so we can help lot of patients build their families and also overcome their humility and uh, des- desperation that they have that's true to have a child that's true so i think once they know that they are pregnant the happiness that we see in their faces that makes your day that makes your day yeah so that i think that's how that's truly inspiring doctor your story of how you took inspiration from these stories um could you describe the uh, landscape a decade ago of fertility treatments um the prevalence the treatment the accessibility what was it like okay when we started like 10 years back means almost like in 2010 mm-hmm. so just then in india the fertility treatments have just started cropping up few clinics here and there 
first it started in mumbai and then slowly it start it started coming back to hyderabad and uh, the prevalence when you say uh, it is there L lot of infertility problems were there even in the past but it is increasing day by day now mainly because of the changing social scenarios previously in india we used to have marriage uh, uh, marriages at an young age like by 1820 girls would get married, married right even 1820 is a late age i would say right. even earlier they would get married and they would have kids uh, kids and finish their family by the age of 10 20 22 so by the time even they know that they have a problem they would conceive and deliver mm -hmm. and human gametes are such that you know it can they can rectify their problems automatically at an young age mm -hmm. even if there is a sperm problem if the egg is very healthy and young then it gets rectified it rectifies the problem of the sperm even if the male has a problem it gets rectified okay. so naturally we wouldn't see that much of a problem but as the age increases uh, the egg becomes more resilient so it doesn't have the capacity to rectify so age plays an important role so with increasing uh, age at marriage mm -hmm. delaying family family planning all this leads to further more problems because as i have said age has an impact mm -hmm. on the fertility of the woman on the fertility of the male also along with the impact of the age there is increasing incidence of other gynecological problems with increasing age of the woman like endometriosis mm -hmm. uh, like adenomyosis which is when we were post graduates we never had these problems we never saw these problems so rampantly mm -hmm. in our women but with changing uh, social and uh, environmental scenarios all these problems have started cropping up in even in our indian scenario so all these increase the risk of infertility and at that time the approachability to the clinics is very less mm -hmm. they only used to go to gynecologists for treatment mm -hmm. but now we have infertility clinic in every uh, road so it's the approachability yeah. yeah so the approachability is more the experience uh, the expertise is more so more and more patients want to avail this treatment and also the affordability also increased right previously the affordability was less only few people a few percentage of people could go to the particular uh, specialist clinic to get the treatment but now everyone is uh, putting their efforts to go and take the treatment and also the advances are so much uh, though it is only a 30 or 40 year old uh, speciality right, right. but uh, the treatments and advances are uh, jumping up right. in leaps and bounds that's true whether we have that what do you say the evidence base that saying that this particular treatment is useful for this particular patient but the advances whatever comes in we have it in india and we start uh giving it to the patients sometimes it is useful sometimes not so trial and error it sure it's a trial and error especially in fertility so the changing landscape of uh, fertility problems prevalence uh, awareness and also i feel lifestyle and stress yeah uh, definitely a, lifestyle and stress and environmental factors plays a big role plays a big role and also i want to emphasize on uh the estrogen uh mimicking molecules that are present in the environment nowadays do tell me about what so what is it about these are present everywhere they are present in your nail polishes in your makeup kits uh, you name it it is there even shaving creams okay so plastics so what uh, what these do is they mimic the estrogen hormone so when you eat food from a plastic container which is which is hot the food mm -hmm. if it is hot it produces some chemicals which acts on the uh, ovaries and it reduces the uh, ovarian reserve slowly oh, so right. in the same way the sperm can also get affected okay so so this also is playing a major role that is the reason why maybe more and more women are uh, having this premature ovarian failure or low sperm count in males that's a big environmental factor and yes, lifestyle exactly. change so even the cups we use for coffee and tea mm -hmm. they are also like uh, detrimental in terms of reproductive health of the population 
knowing unknowingly we use all these in day and day in and day out yeah. because they are more comfortable to use and easy easy access and yeah easy access and comfortable to use use and throw yeah. but the impact they create on our general health and reproductive health is huge so this awareness should be brought in in the regular society that's true i mean i'm sure the listeners must be really alarmed yes you know we talk about uh, pollution but we don't talk about these minute things makes a lot of difference it, it doesn't happen in a day over a period of time it creates lot of impact doctor you mentioned something about environmental factors could you talk a little bit about this for our listeners to understand what effect it could have on their fertility so there are certain papers which have come up to say that you know uh, even water uh, in the con- plastic containers like bottles mm-hmm. when it is left outside in warm environment and right. then utilized that can cause uh, reactions in the plastic which can impact the uh, reproductive health it's not only reproductive health it can impact the other general body health also and it could be one of the causes of cancer as well i've heard breast cancer is one of the reasons yeah. so even for that matter endometriosis oh. so these plastics could be the reason why endometriosis prevalence is increasing previously when we were in post graduation we used to say okay in, in, endometriosis was is very common in western countries mm-hmm. but now we we see the same in uh, our uh, our society so it could it can cause endometriosis adenomyosis adenomyosis used to be pre- more common in women of 40 years or beyond but now we see lot of patients in in their 20s and 30s having adenomyosis mm-hmm. so in that way you know be, mainly because of use of these chemicals or uh, we call them as endocrine disruptive chemicals endocrine disruptive so, chemicals all right so they can cause lot of impact on the reproductive health and also on general health and uh, taking examples from our regular day to day life what uh, what suggestions would you give so minimal minimal use of any type of cosmetics for females even lipsticks creams all natural products should be used even uh, cleaning products mm-hmm. what you use to clean your homes or toilets they also should be more uh, like natural products near to nature than the uh, products what it what has chemicals in it like the toilet cleaners and all that they also can impact uh, the general health so minimal use of chemicals as far as possible even for that matter the pesticides mm. you know from in farmers the sperm counts are very low we happen to see that and even the egg quality we usually start for the treatment uh, in a couple from a farming so, uh, background mm. just because the husband sperm is less but once we start doing ivf sometimes we come to realize that the egg quality is even worse than the sperm yes. oh so in the rural so rural background. population the impact could be because of pesticides though they are away from this pollution right. but pesticides also can cause uh, fertility issues doctor you mentioned pesticides uh, the use of pesticides is inevitable and we consume them uh, through food and vegetables but how else does this affect us could you tell us a little bit about that we should make sure that we eat minimal pesticide when we are taking our food so we can avoid eating pesticides mm-hmm. either by going organic completely or by cleaning the products when, before we eat especially the fruits mm-hmm. so there are various ways how we can get rid of the pesticides before we eat like putting salt or put uh, the bleach in water and uh, soaking them for some time before we eat right. so that is how we can reduce the intake of pesticides uh, and uh, if we are in the uh, farming areas they, uh, we can even, even inhale the pesticides okay oh. so while you are uh, spraying the pesticide onto the farm uh, people can inhale so that can also impact that gets absorbed into the blood in the same way from the skin so what we advise them is to keep away from the pesticides so that you know two three months maybe it will help improve their sperm count or egg quality okay so every attempt should be made to reduce the exposure to pesticide and reduce the intake of pesticide into our body and that does help that does help so how we can do that is to avoid uh, completely 
to go for completely organic foods mm. where pesticides are not utilized. All right. Yeah. That's a note to everybody to listen for the general health as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, doctor, on to a very hot topic that's being debated recently, the Assisted Reproductive Technology and Surrogacy Law, an act. Uh, what does it mean for a patient and what are the benefits of this law? Could you explain to the listeners? This is one important thing that happened in this uh, reproductive treatment, medicine treatment in for the patients who are having infertility problems. Previously, in, this is a fast growing branch and there is there was no regulation like in India or in most of the countries across the world. Mm. So with this law, it becomes regulated. So the patients are the focus for, of this law and the government wants the patients to be treated in a most effective way without being compromised at any point, be it in the, in the type of treatment they're offered and also the end result of the treatment. And uh, in this treatment, we use donor, donors and uh, we use surrogates. So the main aim of the government is to safeguard the well-being of these donors and also the surrogates. And the byproduct is the child. So, uh, welfare of the child is also very important, which uh, has been neglected before. So, they want to safeguard the children also who are born out of this treatment. All right. So, that is the main thing. All right. And what are the benefits to the patients from this act? So, they, uh, the government is trying to regulate uh, how the clinic works, who mm -hmm. gives the treatment to the patient, what is the experience that is needed? Like in according to the uh, this law, at least three years of uh, training should be there at the super specialty level before they are able to independently treat the patient. Okay. And coming to the embryologist, the embryo sh embryologist should be trained. They have to have a specified qualification before they start actually working on the gametes. And the place where they undergo treatment, which is the clinic, should have registered with the law with the appropriate authority that is there in the in the state mm -hmm. uh, so that you know the, uh, the state would know whether the, the patient would know whether the clinic is registered under this authority or not and they can com comfortably go to that place where uh, the treatments are monitored by the by the regulatory authority at the state level and uh, the law also specifies that the uh, treatments that are being done in the clinic should be monitored by the authority Okay. So the success rates or the way the treatments are being done, the amount of uh, medications given to the patients or the donors, everything is regulated now. Okay, with all these regulations? That the regulations, the patient can be confident that, you know, they will get the right type of treatment. And transparent treatment. Transparent treatment, okay. yes. I think this came from the fact that there were so many IVF clinics just cropping about and uh, the whole country. So this regulation, I feel, was very important. Yeah. Previously, every gynecologist is uh, may, uh, has the capacity to do the treatments mm. uh, or do IUI cycles for that matter. But now the law says that they, all the gynecologists who want to do IUI treatment, they have to be registered with the law, with the authority. Without that, they can't do IUI cycles. Right. And uh, previously, the, they used to get the IUI pre sample prepared in the lab and then the sample used to be transported to the clinic where the IUI will be done. Right. But with this law, the transportation of the gametes is completely stopped. Okay. So, you know, transportation reduces the capacity of the sperm for fertilization. Okay. So, in that way, you know, the success can be improved. All these uh, points have been taken into consideration. And this also helps the patient to get a better treatment. It's clear that these regulations are a very big step forward. But what are the standards that the Act dictates for a clinic and its infrastructure? So previously, wherever there is a small room vacant, they used to set up an embryology lab. Oh. So now it shouldn't be a room, but it should be a well-controlled environment where the temperature, humidity and everything is maintained. The particles also should be regulated, the, mm. amount of, the number of particles that are present. So similar to with like where the pharma conducts this research, mm. 
in the same way the embryology lab also should have certain standards to be maintained okay. and this is necessary because embryos are very sensitive to temperature or humidity every degree change in temperature changes the quality of the embryos that we get mm -hmm. and the quality of the embryos that we get or, uh, impact the success of the treatment so all this change in the infrastructure that uh, the stipulations they have given for the clinics to be maintained helps in improving the success of the treatment okay. in the same way they uh, they have maintained that the uh, the lab should the lab should have uh, what do you say this uh, laminar flow equipment mm -hmm. or the ICSI machines everything should be available readily available in the center and also the embryologist who is there should also be in house mm. that was a prerequisite previously embryologists used to move around the whole L like uh, the city yeah okay they used to roam around the whole city jumping from one place to the other by doing so they won't have the concentration or the on main, one patient on one patient or one clinic or sometimes they do batch ivfs where they collate all the patients and then do ivf in one sitting, like two, three days, they do the IVF, finish it off. Oh. So by doing so, what happens, the lab uh, will be left behind for uh, 10 days or 15 days without any regulation, maintenance. Mm -hmm. And the embryologist will just come in, do the procedure for three days and he will move into the other clinic. So all this will reduce the success rates. So to avoid this, the law has maintained that, you know, the embryologist should be in-house. That is also and one important change. ART does bring in that uh, factor for regulating all these clinics and regulations with all these regulations. A welcome step, I'm sure. Uh, doctor, regarding the manpower and expertise required in an ART clinic, what are the mandatory criteria? So the law says that we should have a gynecologist mm -hmm. who has experience or uh, training in the subspecialty of uh, reproductive medicine. So the experience needed is at least three years of experience, either a fellowship or working in a place where they have the IVF facilities. Okay. And they should also be, uh, should have an experience of doing 50 pickups, oocyte retrievals. Uh, that is also mandatory. Okay. And they also suggest that the clinic should have an andrologist, an anesthetist, and then an embryologist who is experienced and who is well trained for three years. One is on site and two years is an embryo in an embryology lab. So these are the main requirements. They also say we should have a counselor, Very psychological important. counselor, mm -hmm. because all these patients are so stressed. You know, the counselor would help them understand more of what is happening and uh, the psychological issues they are facing and how to overcome that. So that is also very important. Very true. And uh, they also mention of having a director who will take care of the administration part of the clinic. So they have taken into consideration all aspects. Oh, overall aspect for the whole clinic. Both yeah. running of the clinic, yeah. It's important for our listeners also to know when they choose an IVF clinic where they could also uh, see and understand that these are the things they should be looking out for in their core team and their supporting team. That's True. very interesting. Consent before starting treatment is very crucial. Uh, what do couples need to know about this? Consent is nothing but understanding what they are going through, what treatment they are being offered, what are the alternatives they have and uh, what is the best for them. So if you look at Fertility treatments, when a patient comes, especially with unexplained infertility, we tend to explain to them if they try naturally what is the success rate, what are the advantages and disadvantages, if they go for IUI, what are the advantages and what is the success rate and in the same way IVF. So they will understand the whole scenario and they will come to a conclusion, this is the right way for us to go. So that is called informed consent. So the law says specifically that the patient should be given the informed consent and uh, counseling should be done in detail about both the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of the treatment and also adoption. Mm. And then we have to leave it for the patient to understand and decide finally. Okay. And uh, they, both wife and husband should be there 
and they both have to give the consent. Okay. And this is more so crucial in in case of using donor sperms or donor eggs, uh, because sometimes couples uh, these people come and say, okay, don't uh, don't tell my husband, don't tell my wife. Mm. So this is not at all acceptable, even in previous guidelines or from the in the present law. This is not at all acceptable. Both the wife and husband should be there give informed consent and then only we have to do the treatment because they should know that they are stepping into this okay and it is more important when they are using donor gametes because this is a lifetime challenge there that they are stepping into and if there is any discrepancy then it is going to be a big problem for them throughout the life and so that they make an informed decision about this lifestyle and they should accept the child uh, once the child is born. So the welfare of the child also comes into play. Got so it. that is why both the pa uh, parents have to accept before they start the treatment. There's a lot of curiosity about embryo transfer. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? How many embryos can be transferred and is there a cap to it? And if there is, why? Usually the trend is like the more embryos you put, the better the success rate is. Because ratio. Yeah. The proportion, the yeah. chances increase proportionately. But the side effects also increase in the same way. Okay. And uh, the chance of pregnancy, the proportionate chance of pregnancy that is increased is less when compared to the risks that are increasing beyond three, beyond the three embryos. That is why the law says that beyond three embryos, we shouldn't transfer. And uh, the Western world is going towards single embryo transfer. Mm -hmm. Because the measure of success of any IVF treatment is considered to be one single healthy baby. Mm -hmm. That is what we should aim for. So that is why we are trying to reduce the number of embryos transferred. Okay. Though the number of attempts might be more. But if we, re if we reduce the number of embryos, the risk for the mother and the baby will be less. So always twins or more than that, the triplets are high risky, highly risky pregnancies. Okay. So the risk of uh, any problem during pregnancy, like be it be diabetes during pregnancy or hypertension during pregnancy, almost doubles or triples if there is if the baby, uh, the lady is having twins or triplets. Got it. And the risk of miscarriage, risk of preterm delivery, neurological impact on the baby, high UGR, everything gets doubled or tripled. So to reduce all those problems for both the baby and the mother, mm -hmm. we tend to try to reduce the number of embryo transfer, a number of embryos that we transfer for embryo transfer. Okay. And we can confidently go down to two or one mm -hmm. if the success rate of our lab is better, if our embryo quality is good. So that's why the law says you should have a better quality lab and better quality embryos and reduce the number of embryos. Transfers. Transfers. And what is the cap in India? India is three. 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 Not more than three. But at NOVA, we are going towards one. That's Mainly because there. of the better labs, best labs we have. Okay. The, uh, the embryo quality that we have and the implantation rates are very good. So our aim is that our implantation rate is around 30 to 40 percent. Okay. So you mean to say that it's not the number of eggs uh, that transferred, it's it's more in number of embryos transferred, but the quality of lab that determines uh, success. Uh, yeah. So when your lab is not efficient, then you have to transfer more embryos to get a better success rate. When your lab is efficient, you, even with one or two embryos, you'll have a good success and less complications. So any patient who wants to embark on to this treatment should aim to have red, less number of embryos transferred. More better so if it is one one at a time that speaks volumes about the clinic and the lab yeah one concerns that couples do have is about mixing of gametes um, how do we avoid that as humans are not foolproof this technology has come up in this rfid system if there is any problem suddenly the alarm will go off will get triggered and we will identify the problem and then avoid the problem by rechecking what is happening mm -hmm. So that, you know, the mix, um, mixing up of gametes will not happen. And the embryologist will take the extra precaution to see what has gone wrong. And he will correct himself so that the actual mixing did not ha doesn't happen. So no mixing is possible? No mixing then. is possible. So All this right. technology is 100% foolproof. Okay. So and the patients can be 
rest assured that this will not happen at NOVA. Genetic testing plays a very important role in IVF. Uh, what is it and how do you, when do you suggest it is done? Uh, genetic testing means we check the embryos mm -hmm. after doing IVF, whether that particular embryo has any genetic problem, uh, either a chromosome problem or a gene problem. If the family has a genetic disease which runs in the form of genes, then we tend to identify the gene and avoid that embryo which has a genetic problem in, the, in terms of genes. If you are looking at chromosome problems, uh, patients who are uh, more than 35 years, especially women, they tend to have a lot of chromosome problems like Down syndrome babies or adverse syndrome like that because of the chromosome abnormalities that we see in the eggs. Yeah. So this we can identify. This also we can identify by doing the genetic test on the embryo, chromosome test. This is called PGTA aneuploidy screening. And if there is translocations in the chromosomes, also we can identify. Especially when parents have translocation of chromosomes, they have increased the risk of miscarriages. They have eight, nine miscarriages. Still, yeah. they won't have a baby. So we can identify that translocation in the chromosomes in the embryo and transfer only the healthy embryo. Got it. So in this way, we can avoid miscarriages, we can have a, a healthy lineage in the family and we can avoid also abnormal things like Down syndrome or Edward syndrome in the children. In cases where donors are required and are advised for a couple, um, how does the couple go about sourcing these donors? Does the clinic provide any guidance? So. Previously, we used to procure the donors, mm. but now the law says that it should be through a donor bank. So whenever there is a need, we tend to guide them towards the donor bank and mm. there they can uh, find out what are the requirements they have and what type of uh, donors they need. And in terms of egg donor, they will send us the donor and we stimulate and harvest the eggs. But in terms of sperm donor, they will have the sperm which uh, semen freezing uh, frozen sperm mm -hmm. and uh, once they select the sperm they will ship that uh, container to us okay. so we use that specific container for that specific couple only we can't store the sperm donor sperm in our premises okay. so that is the requirement the law makes so it is through donor bank All right. we can't uh, recruit donors through from our side so, doctor, when a couple does go to a donor bank, uh, do they have the choice of uh, looking at certain physical or uh, criteria to look for a donor for their uh, offspring? Yeah, I mean, there are different types of criteria each will give importance to. So it all depends on their individual priorities. Mm -hmm. So, color, height, hair texture, education, even the community they come from. Oh, one of the rarest of the asks was if they come from a very business background community so that, you know, they will have highly intellectual. Oh, <laughs> that's also something that they can decide yeah. as a donor. Okay. So that choice they have still. Okay. But mainly most of the uh, couples will ask for a healthy baby, healthy, healthy back, uh, background, family background. At the end, that's what matters, a healthy baby. Uh, doctor, what are the age criteria for donors and how does the law protect or have safety measures in place for these donors? Coming to the donors, the donor should be married, should have a baby of her own and then only we can recruit her and then the age criteria is 23 to 35 years for the egg donor. For the sperm donor, it is uh, again 23 to 51 but the younger, the better. Even males can transmit uh, diseases at a later age. So and the donors should be a bit younger, even in terms of male donors, male sperm donors. And coming to the screening, both the donors will be looked at in regards to their general health, family health, in terms of any diseases running in the family, mm -hmm. and then any sexually transmitted diseases. We do even test for that. In terms of sperm donor, we freeze the sperm and recheck for the communicable diseases like sexually transmitted diseases like HIV, hepatitis B, again after six months. Make sure that the donor is free of all this and then only release the sperm. Okay. But for egg donors, we are not doing that. 
but we again check for the general health family history any communicable transmittable diseases and then we check for thalassemias we check for the general health like creatinine lfts and all those okay. and the sexually transmitted diseases so whatever is preventable we try to avoid all those problems and then only we recruit that to now can couples embryos or gametes be transported to another city or maybe abroad is that even possible previously we used to transport gametes between the clinics between the cities okay. but now the art law doesn't permit this okay. even within the in the same organization between two clinics we can't transport we need to get the uh, permission of the authorities to transport the gametes also be it be sperm or the egg so that is a very strict law only if there is any need for the couple to transport they should get the permission from the authority to transport the particular gametes this uh, transportation or the regulation on transportation is put for the quality of the gametes or because of misuse of gametes mostly misuse of gametes okay. ivf for international patients has uh, been big in the country how has that changed after the art law has been passed okay lot of uh, medical tourism happens in india and fertility treatment is one of that previously we used to have lot of surrogacy treatments mm -hmm. especially for international clients but with this uh, with this law art law and the surrogacy law the surrogacy law completely avoids treatment for international patients so that is a major change we are seeing now okay. but in terms of self cycles there is nothing different uh, only restriction is on the age of the patients so if anyone is foreigner and if they are beyond 55 or uh, in terms of male and if the female is more than 50 we can't treat her. otherwise everything else is the same as before so nothing much has changed for uh, uh, even a couple who is one from abroad and trying to have a baby in as long yeah. as they are trying for a self cycle with the art law uh, in its full swing how do you think it has reshaped the ivf industry in the country the main aim is that we deliver the best of the treatments to the patients uh, with with no exploitation of the donors and surrogates and with the welfare of the child in con in consideration in the context while treating the patient and the patient should be informed and in, an informed consent should be taken with appropriate counseling so if all this happens then we are in the best of the world and with the best success rates to our patients you've been a guiding light to so many in the field of fertility what would be your word of advice uh, for people who are looking to start their uh, career in fertility uh, or clinicians what would be your advice to them so first important thing is they should gain in enough knowledge enough experience in gynecology second they should have enough uh, training exposure in the field of in fertility especially with the law in place the law rec uh, requires 3 years of experience in an infertility clinic so that is very essential my mentor used to say that there are no shortcuts no shortcuts in life but more so in infertility in infertility field so appropriate uh, appropriate training for 3 years will do them a lot of uh, will give them a lot of advantage or edge while mm. practicing and by doing so they will be following the law and they will be able to give best treatment to their clients uh, doctor in your uh, lustrous uh, career of 20 years has there been a story or uh, one story that has stood out in your lifetime please do tell us about that so there are a lot of stories like that but one of it is one of my patients who is 38 years old very poor ovarian reserve uh she lost all her hope okay. because reserve is very less everyone is like telling her that you won't be able to conceive so at that point okay i offered her this natural cycle ivf in the initial stages of my career and she got uh, two sites and luckily we got two embryos 
and she has a baby now. I think the baby is also like around 10 years old. How oh, lovely. So that was the best of everything because, you know, at 38 with two embryos, getting a baby in the first very cycle is very rare. So, and she's one of the patients whom I always remember. Yeah. How adorable. Stepping stones, I think. This was your, one of your first. Great to know, doctor. Um, Thank you for being here today and uh, taking us through this journey and informing us on such an important topic and other facets of fertility. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning into Fertility Tales. We hope today's episode has shed light on some of the complexities and advancements in fertility treatment and the law. Join us next time for more empowering stories and expert advice on your journey to parenthood. This is Simrat signing off from Fertility Tales powered by Nova IVF. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe.